Wonderful. Well, uh, am I recording? Yes. Am I? Yep. Is it recording? Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, there we go. Well, good evening, everyone, and um, a very warm welcome to uh, everyone tonight in this our final lecture in the Gothic Winter Lecture series that we've had that we've been running since early December from the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies. I hope you've enjoyed them as much as as I have and as much as all of our participants have enjoyed delivering their research. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Xavier Aldana Reyes, who is reader in English literature and film and co-president of the International Gothic Association and head of the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies uh, here at Manchester Metropolitan University. Xavier is extraordinarily well published um, and his books include Gothic Cinema from 2020, 21st Century Gothic and Edinburgh Companion, which he co-edited with Maisha Wester in 2019, Horror Film and Affect in 2016, Horror, A Literary History from 2016, and Body Gothic from 2014. I mean, that's an incomplete list, Xavi. I'm thinking also about your work on Spanish Gothic and Spain and the Gothic and a whole lot of other things. Uh, Xavi is chief editor of the Horror Studies book series published by the University of Wales Press and is a founding member of the Horror Studies Special Interest Group of the British Association of Film, Television and Screen Studies. I'm delighted to uh, introduce him to you and to um, uh, announce his, his, or to usher in his paper this evening, which is called Gothic Cinema Towards a Definition. Thank you, Zavi, over to you. Thank you so much, Dale, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for everyone joining us tonight. Um, I realise it's quite late, certainly in, in the UK, and it's also International Women's Day. And so I know that there are other papers being delivered online tonight and that you had a choice. So um, yeah, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, and for anyone watching this after the fact, thank you for watching this video too. So um, here we go. From August 2013 to January 2014, uh, See if I can actually move from one uh, slide to the other. It doesn't look like I can. Oh, there we go. There we go. So from August 2013 to January 2014, the British Film Institute, Britain's most prestigious institution in the promotion and preservation of film, ran a very widely publicised season entitled Gothic, the Dark Heart of Film. Can I just check that you can all see uh, these slides, by the way, um, the ones that say Gothic, the Dark Heart of Film? It's absolutely fine, Xavi, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. So its scale was vast. Um, 150 films were played in around 1,000 screenings throughout the UK, and the season became the longest yet in BFI South Bank history. Uh, that may well have been uh, surpassed by now, but at the time it was um, that was the case. Gothic also included talks from invited guests, specialists, lectures and workshops, new DVD releases, an educational programme, an issue of the affiliated magazine Sight and Sound, containing a special feature on Gothic cinema, and even an accompanying compendium, the wonderful um, Gothic Dark Heart to Film, um, edited by Bell from 2013, the first to transnationally encompass the history um, of the Gothic on screen beyond specific periods. Um, and as a very quick aside, I want to say that um, we were lucky enough as an institution to be involved in this um, exhibition. We did a, a lovely double bill of Dracula and Curse of the Demon um, at uh, the Corner House, what is now um, home cinema. So um, we have very fond memories of that time, but I also can't quite believe that it was a decade ago that we did this. Uh, time has really flown by. The season was very successful and received coverage in major newspapers and tabloids like The Guardian, The Evening Standard and Metro, and was the subject of an article by the BBC, among other things. <clears throat> 
So it seemed that um, after many years of existing on the cultural periphery, as a term used mostly by scholars and architects, uh, the Gothic had finally become a cinematic force to be reckoned with. Gothic cinema's resurgence did not end there, of course, um, for the British Library, another mainstay of British culture, also launched a massive exhibition, um, Terror and Wonder, the Gothic Imagination, in October of 2014, that lasted until January of 2015. Um, like the accompanying uh, book of the same title, edited by our very own uh, Dale Townsend, who also um, organised the exhibition, its exhibits centred on literature, but also importantly included films, um, a decision that demonstrates their value to contemporary perceptions of the Gothic. And one of the things I, I, I'd argue is that the Gothic for us today uh, is perhaps more strongly filtered by filmic memory than it is by literary memory. Um, those are some of the exhibits, but you can see a poster for Last for a Vampire, Hammer Film and The Shining, but I remember Rebecca also featuring strongly uh, among other films. So for all the wealth of interest these events generated, the term Gothic remained somewhat ill-defined in its application to cinema. Possible thematic clusters such as monsters, black magic, hauntings and tainted love were identified by the BFI exhibition, but an overall definition uh, proved elusive, at least in the, all the materials I, I was able to get my hands um, in. The foreword uh, to the Gothic Companion assumed a species of transliteration from page to screen um, when it argued that, quote, Gothic film propelled a long marginalized and sometimes subversive form of literature from the past into the wider cultural bloodstream and in the process turned it into myth. These are the beautiful words, beautiful words of Christopher Frayling. Now, this idea is really attractive. I like it, but I think it must be qualified uh, since only a handful of novels in the Gothic canon, um, notably uh, what Camilla Elliott has called the uh, Gothic triptych, uh, made up of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Robert Louis Stevenson's Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, all of them um, adapted to cinema in 1931, um, have gained mythical status, and that none of them were published before 1818, only relatively late in the first wave of Gothic fiction. The dearth of successful film adaptations of the works of Horace Walpole, Anne Radcliffe, Clara Reeve, William Beckford, Matthew Lewis, Charles Maturin, only some of them, uh, key figures in the Gothic literary tradition, makes that direct equivalence at, at least a little bit tricky. And I am, by the way, not suggesting that there are no adaptations of um, some of these texts. There are three adaptations of The Monk, at least, um, and one adaptation of uh, one of Anne Radcliffe's novels, a French uh, TV series. My point is that they never gained the kind of cultural traction that these other myths did. New film techniques, projection technologies, and audience needs um, have all played a much more defining role, I would argue, in the development of Gothic cinema from early ghostly experimentations with optical illusions to the erotic repurposing of certain figures in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Lust for a Vampire is a good example of that. Um, Ridian Davis's proposition that Gothic cinema was, and these are his words, a host of half-breed human supernatural creatures and a visceral desire for terror that came to live on film, uh, not the torturous prose of the Gothic novel, the purpose of which was ransacked for its vital organs, end quote, hints at a more apparently intuitive understanding of Gothic cinema, one that foregrounds the presence of monsters and of specific sensations that we align with Gothic. Yet, I would argue that both monstrosity and sensation um, are stalwarts of the horror film more widely too. Gothic cinema is normally defined as the result of comparative analogies uh, of adaptation or intertextuality, and while such approach approaches are not uh, in themselves mistaken in either establishing or debunking the weight of a literary lineage or the predominance of a number of associated characters and uh, thrills, their assumptions reveal just how loose the aesthetic and cultural parameters of Gothic cinema still are. 
for me, a number of questions arise. Um, is the iconography of the Gothic film the same or equivalent to that of the horror genre? Are the literary origins of the Gothic what solidified its aesthetics? And in any case, what exactly do we mean when we talk about Gothic cinema? This talk, which is extracted from uh, the book Gothic Cinema, um, where I surveyed over about 500 filmic examples, obviously some of them in very passing detail, uh, suggests that to answer this question, I think, entails a reverse reading of the Gothic, which does not seek to define uh, cues as the starting point. Um, and by the way, before I go on, those are other publications where I've tried to deal with um, the, the this this issue of Gothic cinema in in, in varying degrees of, of detail. The Gothic world, Gothic and the arts, Gothic film, Gothic mashups. They're all collections that deal in one way or another with this point, and there are many more that I couldn't include um, in in this slide. Um, before I propose a rethinking of Gothic cinema, however, it is crucial that I consider generic misconceptions, since my second aim is to begin to delimit and therefore to outline, although I would hasten to add never to police, um, the coordinates of Gothic cinema. And, and I want to be very clear on this. This talk is about what I consider to be Gothic cinema and how I usefully uh, separated from other things. Um, but, but I am very happy for anyone to, to have different opinions. And essentially you can call Gothic cinema what you like. Critics agree on the difficulty involved in categorizing what is uh, like its literary counterpart quote, a form that has been generically mobile, repeatedly hybridizing and mutating. This is how Ian Conrich called it. Yet the Gothic's pliability in scholarly forums, where it has become an artistic category, bringing together all forms of non-realist dark cinema, including certain strands of science fiction, for example, or fantasy, uh, is sometimes at odds, I would argue, um, with the popular understanding of that term. In my view, Gothic cinema is marked by its aesthetic um, and can thus manifest across genres, not just horror. The Gothic's interstitia, inter, I can never say this, the Gothic's interstitiality and indeterminacy stems primarily from its complex relationship with horror cinema. And for this reason, I think it is beneficial to first disentangle the two terms uh, and demarcate the areas of connection and divergence. And I, you know, I'm very interested in horror studies too, and I don't have a problem, um, uh, you know, talking about horror in some of my work. So I wanted to, to begin by, by um, addressing that. So the collapse of uh, Gothic into horror, or vice versa, is understandable. Both the horror genre and Gothic aesthetics are invested in darkness and in negative affect. Generally speaking, the Gothic novel can also be seen as the first manifestation in horror literature, uh, as we know it today, as a form uh, that, that harnessed horrific motifs and crystallized them into fearful, but crucially also suspenseful entertainment. I am not saying, as I will uh, go on to say later, that horror didn't manifest in other ways before the Gothic novel, but that it became uh, a, a package um, at that point. In his path-opening study, uh, The Literature of Terror, David Ponter dedicated a whole chapter, appropriately entitled Gothic in the Horror Film, to the phenomenon of on-screen Gothic, in which he already pointed to the areas of generic slippage and spillage between the Gothic and horror. Uh, Ponta signaled that readers should not, quote, assume that all horrifying films are gothic, but at the same time, it is true that the fundamentally formulaic model, which is conveniently known as the horror film, has indeed many gothic aspects. Two of these aspects are the dependence on gothic literary sources and the interest in ideas of the monstrous, according to Ponta. Uh, even more fundamental, however, is his conclusion that horror film has substantially, these are his words again, and to a rather surprising extent, continued in the Gothic tradition of providing an image language, I really like this, in which to examine social and psychological fears. Both the Gothic and horror have been thought to explore social and cultural anxieties, sometimes openly, but often as negotiations of the repressed, sometimes even as its return, um, and its monsters as manifestations of the id. I mean, this will surprise 
surprise nobody who's ever studied horror. Um, since the Gothic is also theoretically aligned with the uncanny for some theorists, a Freudian notion that can be applied to individual feelings irrespectively of, of genre, the Gothic and horror remain strange uh, associative bedfellows. According to the popular diet, the Gothic is subtle and suggestive, it hints at occluded or only partially visible terrors, thus offering half glimpses of blood curdling images which, because they are seldom fully shown or described, allow our imagination to run wild and fill in the gaps. The Gothic is haunting and favours mood over grisly spectacle. It is interested in recurring motifs and in setting up atmospheres of gloom and unease that may also play with shadows to create a pervasive sense of threat. It is also highly psychological and preoccupied with hallucinations with vivid dreamscapes, often nightmares, and other provinces of the warped mind. Horror, by contrast, is seen as heavily graphic uh, and, and as explicit, as confronting viewers with terrifying images and cinematic numbers, as Cynthia Freeland called them. Gore, especially of the gratuitous type, and violence are the provinces of horror, which fact makes it more oppositional or niche as a cinematic form. It is not for everyone uh, or, or harder to watch, and even dangerous for some people and morally bankrupt, potentially of interest uh, only to sadists. And I say that because that's one of the lines that was leveled at The Curse of Frankenstein when it was released uh, in 1957 of interest only to sadists. Um, for example, the film The Haunting, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, um, is unmistakably gothic, according to this line of thinking, as its effects are built around a sense of menace that manifests through uncanny sounds and a dramatic buildup that feeds on the insecurities of a traumatized individual, individual our heroine Eleanor. By the same token, Hostel uh, is a horror film for sure because many of its scenes portray torture in painstaking detail, and if you've watched the film, it is everything but subtle. So this intuitive separation between the gothic as subtle and horror as explicit is interesting and obviously has a long lineage in, um, in, in, in gothic history that goes back to at least Anne Ratcliffe and her difference between horror and terror and possibly even further back to Edmund Burke and other theorists of fear in the 18th century. Um, and it, it, it is to, to some level helpful. Um, ostensibly, viewers need some method for discriminating between different types of emotional experiences, and the Gothic, with its specific aesthetics, uh, derived heavily from grandiose, ominous architecture and from ghostly visitations often, is naturally perceived as um, the gentler and more complex of the two. But despite this, this apparently straightforward logic, the alignment of the cinematic Gothic with the horrifically acceptable or less extreme runs the risk uh, of stigmatizing more transgressive films and of denying horror, as understood in this uh, taxonomy, its own potential value as more than simply a collection um, of gruesome moments. As Peter Hutchins uh, warned, the privileging of the Gothic, um, which until the 1990s itself was very much in need of uh, re revaluation and academic, in academic and, and popular terms, may be having the simultaneous effect um, of rendering horror nothing more than, these are Peter Hutchings' words, a vulgar exploitative version of Gothic. More broadly, it is simply not true that all horror is visceral and therefore in bad taste um, and accomplished and critically expendable as studies in the film um, have, have shown. And there's too many to mention, uh, but, but Matt Hill says the pleasures of horror is one that, that comes to mind. Neither is it intuitive to consider all non-visceral horror gothic, um, however much power this may bestow upon the latter. Um, this is especially the case when a Gothic reading of a text, um, in itself a growing practice um, in, in academia, whereby Gothic concepts and affiliated theoretical notions such as the sublime or the uncanny end up being the Gothicizing agent um, in, a, in the process of, of calling something Gothic. 
In other words, um, it is sometimes our choice of conceptual tools that makes the film Gothic, and that process in itself can feel inconsequential if analyses do not move beyond the identification of individual and desperate Gothic traits. Um, in fact, as Alexandra Warwick um, argued, such a process can become a critical step that renders Gothic absolutely ubiquitous and simultaneously nullifies it. To argue that the Gothic is not graphic is also to privilege um, a particular Gothic tradition and to ignore its many connections, for example, to the stage, um, especially the violent melodrama and the Grand Guignol. Um, in what already constitutes an attempt to homogenize a self-consciously artificial form, uh, the supernatural explained or the ghostly tradition are normally granted uh, more weighting. Um, this, this is a problem, I think. So a film like The Innocent um, fits this paradigm. The film is orchestrated around startle effects and dread rather than around gratuitous or confrontational violence. Yet, what makes the film gothic for me is not its restraint, uh, but its mise-en-scene and period setting, the use of chiaroscuro lighting, and its resorting to a certain number of tropes associated with the literary gothic, like the damsel in distress, the haunted house, uh, ambiguous madness, and so on. A more recent example, uh, Crimson Peak, um, is a pertinent illustration of how Gothic trappings, such as the crumbling mansion, the, the, the expansive estate, the candle-wielding heroine, which you will see coming up and again um, in, in, in this presentation, um, the proliferation of spectres, do not preclude a film from also um, being punctuated by bloody incidents. Um, in fact, one of Crimson Peak's distinguishing features are its clay red uh, meaty monsters, which you can see on one of the uh, stills there, halfway between the ethereal and the gory, and the aggressive nature of scenes like the face stabbing um, of Thomas, which I have spared you in this presentation in, in my attempt to, to keep it uh, PG-13 of all. <laughs> um, this is not a novelty, obviously, or indeed a contemporary affectation, um, a consequence of a more bloodthirsty audiences and directors, but manifests even in those late 18th century texts uh, that sometimes are taken to be the epitome of a subtle form of the Gothic. And, uh, you know, I am not an expert in 18th century Gothic, but anyone who's read uh, novels like Castle of Otranto, uh, like of Lawyer, uh, they're not particularly subtle and they are violent texts too. What makes Crimson Peak Gothic is once again, its setting, its characters, its motifs. The violence is ancillary and simply contributes to the film's visceral feel. Um, as I have argued elsewhere, the Gothic is indeed very much compatible with blood, violence and eroticism, in fact. Unlike the Gothic, horror is recognized as a major genre, both in academia, where it is routinely included in handbooks to film genre, and perhaps one of the most written about genres of all time, alongside science fiction, uh, the musical, the melodrama, um, but also in popular culture, where it is argued to have begun to coalesce um, as a label in journalism as early as the 1930s. So these are arguments by Alison Pierce, for example, or Gad Gary Rhodes, who have looked at um, the way that horror was written about in, in the 30s and in some cases even earlier than that. Um, horror is also found as a category in film retailers like Amazon or streaming services like Netflix, another indication that its existen existence extends beyond the intellectual and into the practical. Audiences recognize and identify horror films as distinct types of film experiences. As I use the term, horror is a genre self-defined by the primary effect it seeks to have on its viewers, and thus is not bound to a certain type of landscape, setting, or character. You can have horror in space, you can have horror in the far west. Um, matters are, however, slightly more complicated when it comes to the Gothic, which often seeks to generate fear, but is not defined solely by this. So a film like Rebecca, now understood to be a part of the female gothic cycle of uh, films that were popular in Hollywood during the 1940s, is ultimately governed by the elicitation of suspense. 
in Rebecca, the Gothic manifests largely at the level of space through this wonderful um, uh, Mandalay estate uh, that you know is so big that um, the new Mrs. De Winter gets lost in it several times. And also of the narrative uh, and, and the characters, Rebecca, for example, is never seen, but her presence dominates the entire film. Um, I like to think of this film as a as a ghost story without a ghost. Um, the Gothic can and does work independently of horrific affect, but it cannot be completely disentangled from it either. This is because um, although horror as narrative um, element precedes the Gothic novel, um, being a significant component of, for example, the revenge tragedy, it crystallized as pleasurable fictional pastime during the period that saw the consolidation of the Gothic novel and its specific chronotopic markers. For this reason, uh, the Gothic is normally found used as an adjective that inflects horror as a subgenre. Um, Gothic cinema defines films at the level of aesthetics and mise-en-scene, yet its specificity beyond the referential images and situations evoked by the term Gothic in literature and in architecture is somewhat less apparent. Um, an illustration of the, this dynamic appears in Mark A. Vieira's uh, photographic survey of the horror film up to 1968, where the term Gothic evokes all the monsters and situations associated with early horror, such as vampires, the living dead, werewolves, mummies, derelict castles, mad scientists, laboratories, full moons, and Egyptian tombs. Now, since the two main films uh, made by Universal Studios, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein, have their origins in stage adaptations of Gothic classics, um, a term that was already in use uh, to, to, to talk about a type of uh, literature of fear in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, these are films, um, sorry, these early films are understood as Gothic by proxy if you like. Adaptations are crucial to any discussion of Gothic cinema because whereas the Gothic label can be ambiguous, adaptations of well-known Gothic texts present themselves at least as de facto Gothic, regardless of their aesthetic treatment. Um, at the same time, Gothic cinema is palimpsestic beyond direct illusion, often stitched together from the visual remnants of previous films. If we are to move past the current theoretical dead end, Gothic cinema needs to be understood not just as the result of intertextuality, but also as a mode that, while movable, is determined by its temporality and its aesthetic. And that is, I guess, my, my overall point. So let me elaborate. It has been um, proposed that the term mode entails a liberation from any prescriptive set of themes, motifs and figures. These are the words of Hollinger. Yet the Gothic mode is very clearly marked by themes, motifs and figures. More so, I would argue, than by affect or intended emotional outcomes. So is this not a contradiction in terms? Cudden's uh, Dictionary of Literary Terms and Literary Theory hesitantly refers to a mode as, quote, approximately synonymous with kind and form um, and as associated with method, manner and style, a meaning that resonates with those studies of the Gothic that have centered on imagery and artistic allegiances like those of Grunenberg, Williams, Gavin and so on. Um, this gains significance when one considers that the Gothic novel was largely shaped and defined by its use of architectural um, uh, sort of motifs and by space, the Gothic was and is visual and identifiable at the level of surface. And that the apparently decorative effect, these are Napier's words, of its buildings became imbricated in debates about identity, history, nationality and politics. There is some critical consensus that an interpretation of the Gothic that does justice to the complexity of its appearance and that identifies it as deliberately formulaic is a positive thing. Um, elaborating on the work of Robert Miles, Michael Gamer has referred to the Gothic as a shifting aesthetic, able to transplant um, itself across form and media. Fred Botting has further refined this notion by showing how it continues, how it constitutes a negative aesthetics. Uh, its texts characterized, quote, by an absence of the light associated with sense, security and knowledge. And Catherine Spooner has remarked on how a Gothic look is increasingly targeting 
targeted in the marketing of certain subcultural products, novels, films, and so on. If we are to move beyond the reduction of Gothic cinema to horror and avoid the intertextual pit that renders Gothic cinema redundant in its derivation, a new understanding of the mode as a transhistorical aesthetics becomes imperative. Monstrosity and psychological disturbance, which have been used to describe uh, the Gothic, in and, on the, in and of themselves um, cannot be markers of the Gothic mode alone. They're simply not specific enough. For example, uh, monsters may appear in epic fantasy and psychological hauntings have long been the source of legends and ballads, um, a large proportion of which will be Gothic, but I would argue not all of which are. More importantly, a question that quickly emerges is what separates the Gothic from even broader categories such as the fantastic? After all, fantasy has also been described as a series of, quote, structural features underlying various works in different periods of time. These are um, Rosemary Jackson words um, that are inherently subversive at the artistic level. The shift towards the Gothic in instances where in the past texts would have been labelled supernatural or fantastic has been partially motivated both by its cultural momentum especially the establishment in academia of Gothic studies throughout the 1990s and 2000s, and the fact that the term, through its connotations with um, history, architecture and heritage, has more intellectual cachet than horror does. Furthermore, Gothic cinema is not just a horror subgenre because it can and does manifest in other genres too, like melodrama or comedy and not just parodies. Um, and because in cases like that of Gothic romance, the term Gothic inflects meaning at the surface or visual level. It follows then, I think, that the Gothic is an aesthetic mode when applied to cinema, the predominant element for viewers, um, its main recognizable traits remain iconographic and by association also thematic. Um, a castle or mansion on a promontory uh, on a stormy night or a dark dungeon, uh, for example, in the posters for William Castle's House on Haunted Hill or for Roger Corman's um, The Pit and the Pendulum can be uh, connotative enough, I think, to give us a feeling of the Gothic. The Gothic may, of course, manifest interstitially um, as disenfranchised motifs, um, like that of the captive woman, um, which we see in thrillers like Gone Girl uh, or The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. But this will not ultimately gothicize the films at the level of their aesthetics um, or setting. So I would argue those films are more usefully read as Gothic than they are Gothic, strictly speaking. Similarly, um, hybrid films exist, like those that have fallen under the Gothic science fiction rubric that um, Sarah Watson and Emily Alder, uh, for example, have, have used. But again, in this case, the Gothic um, likely works less as a genre marker than as an aesthetic or thematic determiner circumscribing a specific type of science fiction. This is why the Gothic becomes the qualifier rather than the qualified. The Gothic's intended narrative effects are not necessarily contiguous or comparable uh, to social or cultural meaning, although of course that's important too. A monster like that of Frankenstein or a situation like the incarceration of a defenseless heroine might horrify us despite the fact that they explore the injustices of othering and social exclusion or the wrongs of patriarchy. Although the Gothic's images and characters are not monolithic or employed homogeneously in every film, they tend to evoke certain ideas and elicit specific emotions. This is not tantamount to suggesting that every iteration of a vampire works according to the same patterns, or indeed that the presence of a vampire is what ultimately defines a Gothic film. Instead, I would think there are three levels to the Gothic as an aesthetic mode. The surface level, that is uh, a film's use of rec a recognizable set of characters, of settings, of motifs, of themes, the affective um, or the consequences that these images um, have on viewers, generally a set of negative emotional states that we could usefully cluster as fear, uh, but you know, which is 
generally a lot more complicated than that. And finally, uh, the cultural or the type of work carried out by um, a particular implementation, combination or subversion of the Gothic's main aesthetic elements. So my contention is that the mode is identified primarily by its look, not by our reading of its social work as filtered through given national or psychological lenses, um, a process which is absolutely nevertheless manifest um, and of relevance. So what I'm suggesting is an inversion. I'm not suggesting that Gothic does not work in this way, but that we should start Gothic readings with the aesthetics rather than with um, the, 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 so, the social meaning um, of that work. The images, themes and effects that recur in Gothic cinema rarely appear in isolation and they normally function by accumulation, uh, conjuring up certain atmospheres and pervasive moods and I think that needs to be our starting point. So what might some of these be? Landscapes and buildings, especially when temporally remote, are arguably the most essential markers of the Gothic. The closeness between Gothic and medieval during the development of the Gothic romance, um, as well as the predication of this relationship on a feeling of loss and an antiquarian fascination, these are Robert Marr's words, manifested in what Chris Baldick called a fearful sense of inheritance in time, very well-worn um, quote by now, but a useful one nevertheless. Um, the past is an unfair, brutal place um, in the Gothic, one that is defined by threat and the possibility of return of secrets, of curses, of the supposedly dead and of the actually dead who come back in the form of ghosts sometimes. Pervading danger, occult or otherwise, is one of the elements that separates the Gothic film from the period drama, for example. Ruins abound as do mysterious subterranean passages, abandoned or derelict uh, abbeys, imposing castles with many a locked door, inquisitorial dungeons, dangerous mountainscapes and moors, for example. In Gothic films, uh, from the Black Sleep and Mr. Sardonicus uh, to Ivana, which you can see on the bottom left there, recently re-released by Severin Films, I think it's called Scream of the Demon Lover in the English title, or, you know, pretty much any uh, Jean Roland vampire film, you can see those films there on, your, on, on the screen. Um, uh, in, in these films, the Victorian, normally Victorian, not always, haunted house supersedes some of the older settings, especially as the 19th and early 20th centuries become the modern equivalents um, of what pre -enlight of the pre-enlightenment times represented to um, Gothic writers. So suitably distant, superstitious, and barbaric by today's standards. And I think I, I quite like the way in which the castle and the big mansion begin to really uh, become the same thing, really, certainly in Gothic cinema, um, but in the 1910s, 1920s. This is something um, I, I hope to research soon at some point. Although the Gothic is a Western mode typically associated with Protestantism, it can also be seen to manifest in other countries with different religious beliefs and histories. So Japanese films like um, House of Terrors from 1965 or Lake of Dracula 1971 show an obvious debt uh, to Western Gothic films, but others such as uh, The Ghost of Yotsuya, uh, the anthology film Kaiden, which and these, these are titles that will be familiar to the audience, I'm sure, and Onibaba, retraject the narrative action to their country's feudal past and depict unique folkloric ghosts. Similarly, Kim Newman, um, an endless source for a, a, you know, gothic goodness, sees in martial arts and comedy horror films such as uh, The Butterfly Murders, uh, Mr. Vampire, and A Chinese Ghost Story, a distinctly Chinese cycle of gothic cinema. Their settings, um, haunted temples and the occasional castle, and monsters, so ghosts, revenants, can be analogous uh, to the spaces and characters of the Western Gothic, even when in cases like that of the Jiangxi or the hopping vampire and the Huli Jing, a fox spirit, um, these clearly stem from very different traditions. A strong sense of decay and putrefaction, so damp, mold, leaks, collapsing ceilings, um, as well as of overwhelming architectonic scope, such as labyrinthine buildings, wings of mansions kept close, um, somber gardens and forests, are also habitual elements in the cinematography. 
Gothic places are unknown spaces. Characters inherit forgotten estates um, whose dark pasts they feel compelled to explore. They are locked in catacombs. They escape only to find themselves just as disoriented. They are taken to foreign wild lands. As regards the weather, the Gothic is much more evidently signaled by the autumn and winter seasons and by meteorological disturbances that may pose a risk to characters, uh, reflect their state of mind uh, or aid villains in their schemes by providing cover or an opportunity to attack. Gothic films tend to be windy and stormy during key dramatic moments, as the game of shadows and sounds encouraged by the pyrotechnics of lighting and thunder help to underscore a sense of danger and paranoia. Filmmakers may also resort to plumes of concealing fog for, for suspenseful moods. Gothic landscapes um, of any type are further enhanced by a generous helping of darkness Darkness has negative connotations in a number of cultures and is suggestive of death, cold, occlusion, mystery and uncertainty. So no surprise that most uh, Gothic texts have a candle wielding heroin, um, a sign of you know, shining light on this darkness. A dark castle becomes much scarier and a poorly lit street can shelter and camouflage its perils more expediently. The dark can also serve to insinuate and tease when bursts of light um, halo a threatening and unknown silhouette that can also impair vision. As Danny Cavallaro notes, um, Gothic narratives tend to also take place during times of transition from day into night, from summer into winter. Despite this bias uh, towards liminality, night still reigns supreme. It is the time of nightmares, when the connection with the beyond is at its strongest, when murderers and monsters take advantage of defenseless sleeping heroines, when the world rests and there is no one to come to the rescue. The dark can act as a filtering lens too, so gothic films may make heavy use of chiaroscuro lighting, bathing their characters in shadows that highlight their emo emotional disposition or their vulnerability too. But Gothic cinema also tends to create a tonal tension between dark and bright colours, um, as Dracula does, for example, in its use of blood red Kensington gore on it, or, or, or in its pitting of um, signifiers of purity and innocence, normally black and white, um, so evil and corruption, innocence and so on. Um, structurally, the Gothic film tends to be as torturous, untrustworthy and deceitful as its backdrops. Yves Kosovsky Sedgwick suggests that, quote, the difficulty the story has in getting itself told is of the most obvious structural significance out of all of the Gothic conventions dealing with the sudden, mysterious, seemingly arbitrary, uh, but massive inaccessibility of those things that should normally remain accessible. The trapdoors, hinges, and hidden chambers of Gothic buildings find their narrative correlates in plots that involve half-told, repressed or duplicitous stories, or else stage the return of buried and silenced events. These, in turn, may find correspondences at the psychological level in characters who discover aspects about themselves they were not previously aware of, would rather forget, um, or have actively repressed. Flashbacks, either in the form of confessions, as in The Curse of Frankenstein, on the uh, image there, and for example, Interview with the Vampire, or of exposition scenes that fill in the viewer on necessary details, as in La Llorona, The Crying Woman from 1960, can constitute key parts, even the bulk of some Gothic films. Identities can be mistaken, with external doubling of characters or dual personalities being key to the action in the denouement of films like The Woman in White. Gothic films may even possess Chinese box-like uh, box structures like um, the Saragossa Manuscript from 1965 and contain interconnected stories. The most narratively conventional of Gothic films will involve a journey of discovery, whether personal or familial, uh, that is in consonance 
um, with the character's physical trips. So the arrival in a, an uncannily familiar place or into a regressive and inhospitable community um, with a secret normally that doesn't want to, to be let out. Renfield's entrance, for example, into the Count's dilapidated castle in 1931's Dracula, still one of my favourite um, scenes in Gothic cinema, and the pastor's acceptance of an invitation to stay in a remote Lithuanian village in um, Lockies, a manuscript of Professor Wittenbach from 1970, both anticipate dramatic happenings. In those stories where the villain is the main character, um, as in Nightmare Castle on the bottom right, vengeful visitations from the past, real or counterfeit, typically also set records straight. Gothic films, like any other form of narrative entertainment, need a minimum of crisis resolution. If a gloomy landscape populated by archaic buildings is left empty, no dangers roaming the shadows, then there will be little chance for such developments. A source of threat is normally necessary uh, for the Gothic to generate feelings of suspense and dread, even if um, these may be ultimately explained away as mere superstition or tricks of the mind. Naturally, the supernatural um, had a history before the Gothic, and I am not suggesting otherwise, and not least in the chivalric romances um, that influenced the Gothic um, itself. And this is why it is crucial that the one is not collapsed into the other. Um, it is perfectly feasible to think of supernatural films where ghosts, witches, wizards, or Faustian pacts, um, you know, predominate, or maybe, I, I maybe even like the heart of the narrative. Thinking of films like Ghostbusters or Ghost or Bedazzled, uh, Shortcut to Happiness, Bewitched. Um, so all of these films, for example, utilize um, these motifs and characters, but I wouldn't catalog them as gothic. They're clearly romances, action films, or comedies that use. Um, perhaps gothic um, motifs or, or characters. Um, yet, I would argue supernatural, supernatural beings, especially when a source of threat and in a period setting, almost automatically denote gothic. And, and I, I think this still, for example, from Spirit of Evil would probably be described as gothic by pretty much anyone looking at it. And I think it's for those reasons. Um, the film Spirit of Evil, um, is a film about witchcraft and demonology, and these are rendered Gothic through the mise en scène, which is a lugubrious candlelit chapel in a remote Ukraine. And I think this is ultimately what makes the film Gothic, not just the use of the witch. So to recapitulate, the Gothic is an aesthetic mode that is closely connected, but also not exactly the same thing as horror. Horror is a genre premised uh, on emotion and not bound by time or setting. The Gothic, by contrast, in my reading, is a mode that cannot be reduced to the engendering of fear and which can be neatly fenced in aesthetically. Although medieval fantasies may have been superseded by Victorian and Edwardian and even later ones, a strong sense of claustrophobic encroachment in space and time is still required for the Gothic to manifest unambiguously. This anachronistic sense of temporality, of place, um, associated with superstition, with revenge, with tyranny, habitually takes place at the chronological level through a retrojected narrative that is set uh, in less tolerant, in darker times. There are, of course, films set in modern times that can also be um, primarily Gothic in cases, for example, where the buildings themselves or spaces act as modern renditions of, um, for example, you know, the old medieval castle um, or the, the tenebrous abbey, or where they effectively um, amount to the same kind of, of experience. Um, uh, so, um, the distinction then um, that I'm making does not necessarily preclude the Gothic from mani manifesting in horror films either, as I hope to have shown, uh, but the reasons uh, for this is that, um, uh, or the, rather the indeterminacy between Gothic and, and horror comes from the fact that pretty much until the late 1970s, um, one of the most popular subgenres of the horror film was precisely um, the Gothic um, horror film and, and stemmed from that Gothic canon. So we have come to understand horror or define horror through its 
Gothic origins, uh, you know, through the Dracula, through the Frankenstein, and hence the indeterminacy. But I, as I show in um, Gothic cinema in the book, um, at the end of the 70s, especially beginning of the 80s, uh, that aesthetic um, stops being absolutely necessary to convey the kind of uh, transgressive messages around uh, eroticism, for example, um, that it had come to uh, to signify. In other words, the, go the Gothic stops being the only aesthetic through which to tell these stories, and so it becomes something different. And I have tried to analyze exactly what the Gothic still does for us um, in other work, and obviously I have no time to go into that uh, in detail now, um, but I did want to, to end on a final note that hints at that, that work. So for me, um, the Gothic continues to function in a very similar way in contemporary cinema by reasserting the progressiveness of contemporary values, whether these be specifically about gender, um, perhaps an important one to mention during International Women's Day, um, or the difficulty of overcoming traumatic experiences, which has become really important to Gothic and to horror film more generally, more broadly. Although the Gothic may appear to be a predominantly backward looking phenomenon, it is of course, um, in fact, always about the immediate time of production of given texts. It offers 21st century um, horror filmmakers an iconography, a ready-made one, um, with a long literary and visual history that is still able to articulate modern concerns due to its permeability, adaptability, and inherent spatial, tem spatial temporal frictions. Gothic cinema produces ancillary meanings by virtue of film's relationship with a Gothic tradition, our expectations about actions, reactions, and likely conclusions. Gothic places, removed from 21st century viewers and located in times associated with political or technological change, normally very ambiguous and vague times as well, again another thing that separates Gothic from historical um, uh, uh, drama, for example continue to serve a similar metaphorical purpose to the one they did for late um, 18th century and 19th century readers, if such a comparison is, is, is even um, necessary. Gothic cinema therefore needs to be grasped as more than uh, the remnant of once uh, financially successful horror cycles. It also needs to be conceived as more than a catch-all term for all forms of horror film. And additionally, the messages uh, that it advances I would argue, are as vital to 21st century uh, cinema as other forms of horror that, due to their contemporary times and settings, may at first appear to be more ideologically minded uh, or better suited to capture the zeitgeist. And so, my final sentence, I think that for this reason, tracing the evolution of Gothic horror throughout the decades, its constant and innovations, reveals just how aesthetics are intimately tied to ideology and social um, relationships and why they should perhaps be um, our point of origin for discussions about genre and um, its cultural importance. I hope that makes sense. Um, and once again, 